I think it's tempting in an era of internet, universal internet penetration virtually and the use of social media by millions and millions of people around the world to assume that social media use by the common citizen is having uh, a major impact on government policy uh, domestically as well as uh, at the you know, foreign policy level, at the diplomatic level. The truth is rather more complex. I think that rather than individuals or members of civil society using social media in order to push the envelope as far as public policies are concerned, I see greater evidence of governments around the world, individual leaders, actually leveraging social media to widen their own or to deepen their own legitimacy, to push policies that they, that they support rather than what people may want. Uh, so essentially, social media today has the possibility of democratic communication, democratization of, of certainly public policy discourse, if not policy making. But in reality, uh, governments are, uh, you know, to, uh, governments to a very high degree enjoy uh, monopoly power over uh, the terms of debate and the terms of discourse. And I think that whether it's a Donald Trump or a Narendra Modi or any other, you know, important world leader, the use that they have made of Twitter, for example, or other forms of social media has really been to uh, push their own point of view, push their own policies, push their own personas, uh, and uh, in a way to actually widen the impact or even strength of government, deepen the strength and impact of government rather than civil society or individuals actually um, bringing about a change in what governments do. Uh, you do, of course, have examples uh, of effective use of social media by civil society organizations to insist on defending a well-established norm of international law. For example, when the Syrian refugee crisis erupted a couple of years ago and we had those horrific images of um, Syrians making their way to Europe any which way they could and the tragic photograph of young Elan Kurdi who died on a beach. I think the use of social media at that point by citizens groups around the world certainly managed to bring about some change in the way at least some European governments, not all, I think the bulk of European governments still continued to flout their obligations under international refugee law, but certainly in the case of Germany, I think the social media campaign that heightened the suffering of Syrian refugees uh, you know, was an important factor in the decision of the Angela Merkel government to open Germany's doors and to be much more accommodating. So there are examples on the positive side. On the negative side, you have the use of social media by insurgent groups in Syria, for example, where uh, one is never quite clear what kind of information or the veracity or the authenticity of information that begins to circulate, say, about a chemical weapon attack or any other kind of atrocity. And these then feed into policy decisions taken by the United States government or Britain or France, as we saw very recently in the uh, bombing of Syria. So I think that uh, social media, sadly, has become a weapon that governments and vested interests are able to use much more effectively than ordinary individuals or civil, disinterested civil society. And I think that until we see greater democratization within societies and at the international level, probably this imbalance is going to carry on.